Greetings, hello and welcome. I'm Steve Clemens, contributing editor for The Hill. Thanks so much for joining us today for our program, Closing the Gaps in Health Insurance. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Consumers for Quality Care, for their support of today's discussions. Listen, a record number of Americans are, are insured, with over 90% of people having some form of health insurance. You might think that's a good thing, but listen, Many insured Americans remain vulnerable to significant medical expenses, including high premiums, out-of-pocket costs, prior authorization burdens, you get it. How can we address rising medical costs and accessibility issues that a lot of these insured Americans face? What policy changes are needed to improve affordability across the healthcare landscape and ensure that the pursuit of care doesn't jeopardize their financial stability? Ultimately, how do we build a healthcare system that works better for its patients? That's really the key issue. We're going to be putting these questions and more in front of our fantastic lineup of speakers. But first, a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us at, at the Hill Events using the hashtag, hashtag the Hill Health. We're broadcasting live and we'll take your questions throughout the program. We already have some really good ones. And as with any live stream, you could experience occasional trouble with the video. I laugh at this because please do not throw your computer or screen through the window. Refresh the page and that should fix all the problems. Congressman David Schweikert of Arizona sits on the Ways and Means Committee, and he's a senior House Republican on the Joint Economic Committee. I spoke with him just a short while ago. Take a listen. Congressman, it's so great to be with you this morning. I've always enjoyed our conversations, and I want to tell our audience that uh, Dave Schweikert is the lead Republican on one of my favorite committees in Congress that has no power, no votes, but it is about raising the quality of thinking about economic policy and about our thinking. That's Joint Economic Committee. I love the work of the Joint Economic Committee. That said, here we're to talk today about what the health ecosystem uh, is generating uh, in terms of outcomes on health. But but when you get to the kind of the cost dimension, you know, I have to, you know, I sometimes feel like we have to have a very kind of interesting mat, uh, you know, rat maze to figure out how to optimize this healthcare system. But as we think about you know, costs of healthcare today and getting more, co you know, coverage for Americans and better quality healthcare. Where are we screwing up? Oh, um, pretty much everywhere. <laughs> um, okay. It, can I first give you um, a, just a simple framework for the discussion? We make a huge mistake as policymakers, as, as, as experts, as press, because we keep talking about healthcare and we're not actually talking about healthcare. We're talking about healthcare financing. Hmm. The ACA, Obamacare, the Republican alternative, Medicare for all, those are financing bills. They're about who gets subsidized and who has to pay. We're not actually having structural conversations on what, on what we pay. Think, think about that the, there's a huge difference there. One is, okay, um, even the title of part of our discussion today was, a, you know, accessibility on insurance and insurance costs. Insurance functionally is a financing mechanism. Mm. It wasn't a discussion on, hey, what technologies, what models have we brought forward that change the price of healthcare? Um, in, in many ways, we're having the discussion of blockbuster video of maybe a more efficient drive through window to get your little DVD mm. than net Netflix crashing the price of entertainment in your home because now you're streaming it into your home. You don't drive to the neighborhood convenience store. Um, it, it, I, I hope that scenario makes sense. Oh, it, it does make sense. And, you know, I think that both sides of that about, you know, we are talking about real deliverables in healthcare, you know, versus how this system provides it. And what I see is a system where increasingly Americans are caught in this battle between insurers and providers. And, you know, we see so many Americans. When I did my uh, research on this discussion today, I was shocked to see how many Americans were carrying more than $10,000 or more in health related debt. Yes. Um, and that health related debt is spread among the vast majority of people who have health insurance. So it just sort of raises, we're not talking about the folks that don't have health insurance. We're talking about folks that are covered and yet are having a hard time struggling. What do we do to sort of begin thinking more holistically uh, as you just did and, and call things what they are, that we have a finance problem in healthcare, 
Uh, and then we have another thing of maybe we need to look at how we're delivering healthcare and revolutionize that. Um, if I wanted to be a disruptor, and I do want you to be a disruptor. <laughs> it, it, well, I, I do. And it's one of the reasons why um, you get the crap kicked out of you daily when you say things like this. But it's true. Um, the first step I would go is legalize technology. Hmm. You go, huh? The technology exists today for you to have in your home medicine cabinet a thing you can blow into that almost instantly diagnoses you by talking to your phone and saying, oh, um, hey, you have a virus of this category, or you have a bacterial infection, or you have this. And it could quickly bang off your medical record saying, hey, you're not allergic to this antiviral and order it. And an hour or two later, Lyft could drop off that antiviral to your house. Mm. The cycle time, the fact you have a medical lab in your home medicine cabinet, ideas like that, you could change much of the cost curve because you've removed much of the cost of the system. Except for one small problem, that technology is functioning illegal today in our system at the state level, the federal level, you've allowed an algorithm to write a prescription. And people say, well, you can't do that. Of course you can do that. Um, you see people with their diabetic um, sensor and pumps, that's an algorithm dosing them all day long. There's a number of algorithms that have been um, approved by the FDA. It's just our structure either says, hey, we only want a, you have got to walk into a facility or do this type category of telehealth to get that prescription. You're not going to legalize the reimbursement. You're not going to allow a pharmacy to fill this prescription. So, so my first um, thesis is just, just allow technology to participate in the mix of providing services. And I believe that right there would start the first cost disruption. You know, one of the things that you also do is you're co-chair of the telehealth caucus. You just talked mm -hmm. about telehealth. And in that, this was something that before the pandemic came along, I would say telehealth was kind of on wobbly experimental legs. Oh. It certainly had not uh, permeated and you know become sort of ubiquitous uh, in the healthcare provision system. And, and that seems to be one of the cases where you know technology has now been embraced. Um, hopefully, the reimbursability of, 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 of health therapy and provision uh, by telehealth will continue. But I guess the question is, what, what did it take in that case, because you were so involved with it, to bring it there? And so as you're talking about you know, the, the screener in your home or other technologies, how can we follow the telehealth okay. path so we can go from an archaic system to something much more modern? Yeah, and I'm sorry for sounding cranky first thing in the morning, but- no, it's uh, great. I like cranky, uh, um, Swikert. <laughs> okay. First off, remember, telehealth was one of the most lobbied against right. technologies in Washington, D.C. I, you know, I introduced my first telehealth bill a few years ago, and it was never, ever, ever going to get a hearing. And it wasn't until the pandemic hit and we needed something to plug in that, that legis our legislation moved forward. Um, the day the pandemic is declared over, so is the expansion of telehealth. It's over. Mm. But now's the moment where we've proven that the critics were wrong. They said, well, older Americans don't know how to use FaceTime. They don't know how, to, well, it turns out none of that was true. And there's been mass adoption. Now it's the, I believe, instead of discussing whether telehealth should be allowed to continue, it's the next level of revolution of telehealth where it's the thing I wear on my wrist or, or tape to my chest or the saliva I put on that's the sensor and telehealth is more than just FaceTiming, you know, my medical professional. It's the data I can produce off my body, talking to either the algorithm or the healthcare professional. It's, okay, so you, you've built basically the baseline of acceptance on telehealth. Now, what does it look like if part of our goal here is, is to expand access and crash price? And, and then we'll get the folks that come in the door and say, well, I'm from rural America and we don't have broadband. Well, okay, we have these things called satellites now, you know, the micro satellites, every inch of North America now has broadband, but 
trying to teach people to actually like read um, today's, you know, and we're not trying to lay a piece of copper wire to the middle of the Navajo Nation. That was a great idea 30 years ago. Today, we all have Starlink satellites. Um, if we would just put that into our mix of, it's here, our, but our policy sets are two decades out of date. You know, another area you've been an active player, and then my friend, Congressman Brad Wenstrup, who's involved with the Doctors' Caucus uh, in, in the House, um, stepped forward and they really created what was an unusual, bipartisan, bicameral piece of legislation. It's sort of one of these unicorns you rarely see anymore. Um, and it had to do with surprise medical billing and the burdens that patients have uh, when they're hit from these, you know, huge zinger costs that come out of nowhere uh, and how they get resolved. And, and you know, I, I just I, you, you applauded this effort. Uh, this bill passed. This bill was signed by the president. But it just seems to be chaos since what's going on. Um, OK, um, <laughs> you've been you cranky. For a while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The cynicism. <laughs> Um, remember, the surprise billing model became a backdoor financing mechanism for very high rates of return, particularly for a certain amount of Wall Street money that moved through the United States, purchasing emergency rooms, certain practices, um, and the ability to say, hey, you're not in network, so now I get to charge you this insane rate, and then you know we'll sue each other, we'll maybe negotiate it down. We came up with a bipartisan, bicameral um, surprise billing legislation saying, okay, here's the mechanisms, here's the arbitration, here's as a way to get rid of those, those crushing outliers because you showed up in the wrong emergency room. And then it hits the bureaucracy, the White House, and the agency seems to be drafting language and rule sets that aren't for the bill we passed. It was for previous sort of generations. And my cynicism is, is the, are the army of lobbyists who are pounding on us here on Capitol Hill, that function we're representing venture capital mm. from Wall Street, now pounding on the bureaucracy. Um, because that's the only excuse I can come up with um, why the rule sets don't actually look like the language. Pretty fascinating subject. Let me ask you just finally, Congressman, you know, when it comes to the financing um, speed bump, bump, stumbling blocks, you know, Americans are carrying in the healthcare space and you know, just resolving some of this. Do you have any kind of, you know, out of your, you know, left sleeve ideas just to clean this up? You know, yeah. I talk about healthcare so much. You and I have had so many great discussions together. It's the one issue I think is so important, but I also wish would go away because things began to get solved. And I'm just interested in what a solution playbook might begin to look you like. You know, you just said something is absolutely brilliant. And um, it's it's the, the ultimate solution is cures. Um, if 5% of the population is over 50% of the healthcare spending, and you often have some folks throw out the numbers of the end of life, there's actually a real distortion in that. When you get that end of life calculation, that's actually for that individual. The real cost is societal. It's the 5% with multiple chronic conditions that chew up the vast majority of healthcare spending. Um, the most revolutionary thing you and I could do is push, 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 incentivize, incentivize um, cures. So the most radical one I will give you, and it's been just wild in my office, the pushback against the idea, which will sound insane, is a cure for diabetes. Wow. We know in the field, um, we've now had, I, I think, believe several Americans cured of type one. Now it's short term, we only have a small data set. It's a stem cell to a pancreatic um, insulin producing cell um, technology with a small tag on it. So the body doesn't um, see this foreign one to reject it. But you would have thought instantly Washington DC would have been giddy that we're that close in this technology and it would have become this, this decade's functional operation warp speed. Because if diabetes is 33% of all healthcare spending, 
31% mm. of all Medicare spending, and Medicare is the primary driver of U.S. debt. Right. Um, but, you know, I represent a population with the second highest diabetes rate in the world, you know, one of my tribal communities. It's moral, it's compassionate, it's great economics. And it sort of fits what you were just saying is if we're truly close to curing sickle cell anemia and you know, you, you, you hear the list of things we now know how to do either through stem cell or um, mRNA, mm. messenger RNA type technologies. Maybe instead of spending our money in a maintenance model, it's now time to say we as Americans are going to fixate on the curative model because that has the long-term benefit of crashing healthcare spend. And it is shocking how the lack of embracing of that idea around here because it blows up much of the healthcare business model. Powerful vision. And I appreciate your words and thoughts this morning, Congressman Dave Schweikert of Arizona is ranking member of the Joint Economic Committee, is co-chair of the Telehawk uh, Health Caucus. Uh, and he always says, yes, when I call him up, say, let's talk about some uh, cool stuff, even early in the morning. Uh, so, Congressman Schweiker, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.